Um, so let's let's do something to do a break uh, break the ice. Uh, everybody, uh, stand up. Let's let's stretch. Everybody, just just one minute, right? We're we're in family, so we feel comfortable about asking questions and everything. Uh, so let's do a, a, a few claps, like one, two, keep going, keep going. So this will be a standing ovation. Thank you. Thank you. So now I can tweet, I got a standing ovation. I'm going to talk. Everybody loves, all the people that love serverless, they'll be contributing to the, to the project or incubating. Anyway. Um, so let's, let's get started. Um, I have some people that will tell me if I go, go over. Um, if I don't get, I, we have until 12, 12, 10, right? Um, and Matt is after me, so if you stay here, you will get, you get double bonus. You'll get to hear about OpenWIST twice. Um, and we'll go deeper into the repos uh, with Matt. I'll, gi I'll give an overview. Um, so my name is Carlos Santana. Um, I don't play the guitar, not a musician. I was good with math and then good with, with computers. Um, I work in IBM. I'm also a PMC member and committer for Apache Cordova PhoneGap. Anyone have used PhoneGap or have heard of Cordova? OK. There's, there's a big um, conference going on, uh, PhoneGap Day. So I think all the committers are over there. Um, uh, so I started this, uh, this project. Uh, we, we went into incubation December. So OpenWIS is, is currently in incubation. The project had been in, in GitHub in open source for about a year. Before that, uh, it was inside IBM being developed. So, so for today, I'm going to give a, a quick uh, evolution of why would I care? What is this serverless thing? I've been doing server, servers and you know, J2EE and Node.js servers for a while. So those are the type of servers we're talking about. So the, the evolution. Many years ago, I started working in, in, in storage and, and, and service in IBM. So I had a, a lot of experience dealing with physical servers, Intel and PowerPC. So that's where developers or applications, um, you needed to build your servers. But uh, for developers, it was like step 70, right? By the time you got to install your application, like the thing that did something, um, it took a while. And sometimes it took a while for another team to set up the storage, to set up the network, and get the CPUs and everything. So we got an evolution on that. And then came VMware and the VM revolution. And that got a little bit easier, where somebody just gave you an image. But you still managed an image. You were in control of the operating system. And also took a while to get to that, to that level of getting that application up and running, and getting a solution, and getting a prototype. Then we went to. I missed the slide. Uh, containers. So recently, containers becoming the sandbox or the methodology of. Is this plain? Why is this thing not staying? Do not play. How do I make it not play? Let's see. I can do this. The full screen. And we send it. Let's see if we can. I think I'm not touching anything. Start again. Um, so, yeah, I was talking about containers, it's the new methodology of deploying applications. And that became easier. Uh, but you still needed to do some management and orchestration of containers, uh, something like Kubernetes or Docker Compose. You're still managing servers and orchestrating them and load balancing. And then how many do I have? Which regions do I, do I put them? Um, and then with functions, um, it's the, the new evolution also uh, coined by Lambda, Amazon Lambda. It becomes easier. So you, you don't have to manage the server. You, have, you don't have to worry about the infrastructure. You care about small snippets of code that you put in the cloud or you put, you know, put in the system in the platform. And then the system will take care of elastically deploy them and run them. So you just concentrate on just, just your code, uh, literally in functions, not, not a set of a, of a server of, uh, of, a, of one monolithic app. Um, the programming model is very, is very simple. Um, we, call, we call them a triggers, a vendor uh, programming language. Um, 
these are some of the trends. Um, the, I put them just to have them in the slide. I'm go not going to go over them, but if you have business people that you want to convince about trying out or getting started, um, this is kind of the market trends on, on the type of industries or applications. Also, the, the, um, some of the industries that are, are getting into uh, serverless. Um, Bluemix is the IBM cloud platform. So we have, um, just a quick overview, we have many things, we have many services, but it breaks down in terms of compute to uh, the, the starting range with, with serverless, which is OpenWiz. So we run OpenWiz in our, in our platform. And then you have platform as a service, which is uh, based on Cloud Foundry, and then you have containers, and you have VMs. So you have, you have a spectrum of building different applications in a single cloud, taking advantage of I think uh, last count was 150 different services from uh, cognitive IoT, uh, Watson, uh, NoSQL databases, and different services. So as a managed server, that's what we offer. But today, we're going to concentrate on the open source project. Um, this, this is an Apache and not a business, business set. So OpenWhisk. So OpenWhisk is a function as a service. Um, everybody's giving it a different name, um, event-driven programming model. Uh, the worst name that they were given is serverless uh, because there's a bunch of servers uh, actually, but they're not managed by you, they're managed by me or my team. Uh, so we have a lot of VMs. Um, and I was giving a talk this week of our challenges as committers of running this application is how do we feed so many functions in a single VM for all these multi-tenant users and at the same time doing in a you know, single digit millisecond uh, running these containers, uh, these functions. Um, it's open source, uh, it's Apache incubation. I think everybody's familiar with Apache. Um, we are uh, partnering with Adobe, so Adobe and IBM are kind of the, the, the two companies that started the project, but we're looking for contributors um, and, and committers. So I think like, like any, uh, everyone will tell me like get in line, everybody's getting con <laughs> committers and contributors, but I think at this point we're looking for users just to tell us um, what, is, what are we doing wrong uh, what are the things that are missing? Um, a lot of the committers already are very familiar with the project, so we already lost that train of that first person trying it for the first time and finding that maybe the documentation is not that clear or maybe the tooling is not that clear. That's why I think where we, we want to get, to get feedback. Um, as any other, as you guys work with open source projects, that's how you started in your open source project as a user, right? Either your company or yourself. So that's what we're looking for. We have, we have it as a managed server in, in, in Bluemix. Um, it's a, you can get a free account. Uh, you get a, a certain amount of actions for free a month. It's, for, it's similar to Amazon Lambda and the other ones, 400 uh, gigabit seconds. The concept of um, OpenWiz is a little bit different described from other platforms. So our, our model, we try to make it very, very simple, where you define a trigger, so this is the, the the non-blocking or async uh, invocation. So you have a, a trigger, which could be an HTTP, but in, in this case, it's, it's, a, it's a trigger for an, for an event that you want to respond to that trigger uh, or just fire and forget. But you need to connect them to somehow with a rule. So the, actually the entities that you program or you declarative program in, the, in OpenWiz is you're going to define a, a trigger, it becomes an endpoint, and then you declar declarative define which actions do I want to that when that trigger fires? It could be multiple actions. Somebody was asking Slack, and I opened Slack um, today about how do I run two actions with one trigger? Well, that's, that's the purpose. You define two rules uh, we want for one trigger, and then you can run two things in, in parallel. Um, that, you show there the actions? Yeah, actions. Uh, actions is the code, it's the function. So in the entity in the, in the programming language or the programming model is called, is called actions. So you create actions, you invoke actions, you update your actions, you annotate your actions. So that's kind of the core of, um, of, of, the, of the function as a service platform is your actions run and they get you results. Um, the, the, the simplest way of uh, API to define these actions is you take JSON in, a JSON object, either your programming language of Java, JavaScript, Python, and it, and it uh, outputs a, a result in JSON. It could be an empty JSON if it just, you don't care about the result, but it needs to put JSON out. 
In terms of supported languages, um, out of the box, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the, the, the details, uh, we support Node.js. Um, looking at analytics is very popular. Um, but we also support Java. Um, uh, Docker should be down there. But uh, Swift 3, for, for people that are doing mobile development, Apple, Swift on Linux. And, and Python 3 was added, but Python, to, Python 2 is also su still supported. So um, I know there's a big debate between Python 2 and Python 3. I'm not a Python guy, so. <laughs> um, then, then the Docker is more of um, anything else that you have. If you have C++, if you have Go, if you have Rust, um, those things uh, are, can be compiled. You have a batch script. Uh, and basically, you, you define a, a Docker image, and then the system will Docker, Docker run it, catch it. So you pay a little bit of penalty of, of the code latency if you're using something of what is not the one supported. But like the, if you're using the open source project, is you're, you're deploying this thing. So you can make any, any language be default and be a warm container and, and support it. If, you're, you're, if you want to have Go as a primary language, you can do it. Um, yeah, anything that runs in Docker, Intel, right? Um, that's the thing I've been talking to someone uh, this week about uh, supporting ARM. So um, somebody told me that there's ARM servers coming up and they are looking into contributing or looking into OpenWiz. So I, I told them that I'm open to, to investigate and, and work together. Uh, supporting, supporting models, so basic, basic trees. Either fire and forget is kind of the most common one. So if you have data from IoT or from a message queue, um, if you have changes from a, a database like CouchDB, if you have um, a webhook from GitHub, basically these are fire and, fire and forget. Those are the, the non-blockings. We have the blocking ones where you are, you're calling that kind of a REST API. You want the results back. You want to be very fast. So those, those are the blocking ones. You're expecting a result back. Um, and th those are like you go directly to the action, and you don't have to go to a trigger or a rule. You know the action that you want to run, and you, you want a response very fast. And the last one is periodic alarm. Um, I'm going to go over one example of those. Um, we also support sequences, a se sequence. Um, so you can have an action um, developed by you or developed by somebody that shared the action in the system that you may not know what is the programming language that they're using. But they could be giving you a, a, an action to talk to GitHub or talk to Slack. We have some system actions. Um, so you can change, change them as, as a sequence. So you have an action that takes input as a JSON, puts output as a JSON, the parameters match to the next action and the next action and the next action. I think we have a limit of, of 10. Uh, but again, if you have the open source version, those settings, you can, you can change them. Um, the, other, the other aspects of an action is parameter binding. So these are default parameters that you set in your action that you're not expecting the user to call them with those parameters. So mostly, uh, some of the times it's used for credentials or an API key uh, that you don't want to put in your source code in GitHub. You want to bind them when you deploy them. So that's kind of the configuration uh, part of configuring your actions. Uh, event providers or uh, event emitters are uh, daemons or uh, different notification systems that would give you the, the events. Uh, yeah, it's providing events. It's firing triggers. So in GitHub, for example, will be a webhook. Uh, the alarm system is a uh, daemon service that we have that is, is basically implementing a cron job and firing that, firing that trigger on, on the, on the cron, based on the cron syntax. Um, we have open, open interfaces. Basically, that's saying that we have a REST API. So you can implement your own, own trigger whenever you want to fire trigger, just call the REST API, and that will, that, that will start the change, the change of uh, sequence. Uh, these are some of the examples. I think I've already mentioned them. Um, the last one that we implemented was Kafka. So if you have, um, have an example, I heard this week that there's a lot of you know, interest on IoT, on message queues, on burst loads uh, from the field. So um, in, in Bluemix, is, uh, the product name is called Message Hub, but it's just Kafka. It's Kafka as a service. Uh, if you use the, the open source version, uh, these providers are in open source, by the way. We have Alarm, uh, we have CouchDB, and we have Kafka. Uh, mobile Push and, and uh, IBM App Connect, those are things that are only available in Bluemix. Uh, push notification is, is a service that is using an API to send 
push notification using the IBM service. Uh, and GitHub is just a, it's a webhook. That's the most simple way of explaining it to someone. Uh, granular pricing, so I think that's the third dimension. So I, I mentioned that serverless, you don't deal with infrastructure. The second one was you change your, your mindset of dealing with events, so it's an event-driven programming uh, model. And the last one was it is, and some, some other providers like offer somehow uh, monthly payments, but in Bluemix, this is not part of the open source project, right? You, if you run in your laptop, you don't pay anyone. But in Bluemix, uh, we, uh, we charge per gigabit second, so it, it depends how much memory you give to the action and how much milliseconds does it run. And then you pay, I don't know, there's four zeros there, uh, 17 gigabit seconds is basically the same price as other ones uh, with, with Bluemix. The API gateway is free. Other vendors charge for it. Um, so today I was trying to do, we have a calculator, by the way, and there's also your Google serverless calc, calc. It will give you, you can do five million. I was think today I was doing a calculation of like 20 million invocations a month with the free tier. 128 max actions, 500 milliseconds. So that's, that's enough to, to run for a while. In terms of the architecture, this week I was very excited because I, there was a lot of you asking me, how does it get built? How do I deploy it? What, what is inside versus just what can I build with it? So the, the architecture is based on, on Docker containers. We encapsulate the, the services in Docker container. We have a NGINX, which is just do the SSL termination, routes the controller. A controller is built in, in Scala. It's a web server. Um, it uh, uses CouchDB to for, for state management. It uses Kafka for queuing. And then um, it uses the invoker is another, another Scala uh, web server, which is a container that is the worker. So we have multiple invokers that it will, it will do the work of running your functions. Um, one thing that I was telling folks this week was in IBM, we have the similar uh, deployment. So there's no private code versus open source code. It's we just take it as it is and we deploy it. It's just like we need to integrate with our authentication of our Bluemix with your IBM ID. So we have authentication integration. And then we have uh, Elasticsearch uh, for monitoring. And this is something that uh, the open source project is already looking at of having this in open source. Uh, we have it in Bluemix because we are we're managing a multi-tenant, so we need to need, need the logs for the controller and the invoker to maintain the system. And, and but we have found that uh, folks want to get that Elasticsearch, so we can get the logs and the results of your actions, put them in an in Elasticsearch, and then it's your data. Then you can have Kibana on top of it or anything like that. API gateways. Uh, the last thing, major thing that we did. Uh, also, one of the GitHub projects that Matt is going to discuss, uh, discuss um, is about uh, defining APIs that can run your actions. So you're defining a CRUD operations and things like that. But the, the, the reason that the team did it was, and it's included for free um, in the Bluemix offering, is to have rate limiting. So if you want uh, to have rate limiting or you want to have um, API keys or API secrets or have cores enabled by default, and what's the other rate limiting, and OAuth. So they will do OAuth token validation for, for things like Facebook, uh, Google, um, and the third one is, is GitHub. Um, this is a, a quick example of how would you define a, a crowd operation. So you have customers, so you do a, a get, a delete, a post, and you map them to a certain function instead of ma mapping that to a single, single code base. So you can have your monolithic app break into microservices where each each of the endpoints deal with something uh, particular. This is an example. So I was promising that you guys were going to see code. Um, uh, with, this is basically with the CLI. You, we have a UI, which is in, in our Bluemix ecosystem, but, but from open source, is, there's a CLI. So you create um, an action. This is just returning a payload. Um, using the CLI, you create the action. Um, you define an API and then and then call it. I think we're missing the, the dash dash web true. There's a flag in there. I'll have a demo on, on showing that. Um, web actions are developers are bad naming things, right? Uh, uh, we we didn't know what to call it. So 
it's an action, but it's, it's for, for web development or URL. Basically, it takes, takes a regular action or a traditional action, and it puts an annotation saying, this is web export or web equals true, and basically gives you a public URL. And then you can give that public URL to, to anyone. And then you can invoke it with any verse, right? Your delete, your post, your put. And it becomes a kind of your REST API. Um, and then with inside the action, I don't know if we have it here. We should have it here. Inside the action, this is where like you're, you as a web developer, it's like, ha, ah, finally, I see a web server. <laughs> you have access to the, to access to the request, uh, access to the headers. Um, you, can, you can return the header. You, so you have access to the, to the request coming in, and you have access to control the response. So if you want to, in the first one, you want to return a 302 or 301 with a ready deck, uh, you can do it. If you want to return HTML uh, with a cookie, you can. Or just return JSON, you can. So this is where some folks were asking, like, how do I do a web server uh, with serverless? Uh, it will be basically using web actions, where you have control of that HTTP request and response. Um, yeah, this is this is a part of the response. Um, yeah, this is this is just an echo. Don't, don't get confused. This is the stuff that you have access as from the request. Um, so you have access to the path, uh, the headers, and the body. Basically, that's that's the only thing that you need for my for my HTTP request. Um, Kong is another way of doing API gateway. Um, they implement it. We work with them since our open WIS are open, open source, open standards, uh, REST APIs. They implemented a plugin. So if you have Kong in your shop and you want to use Kong to define APIs uh, backed by actions or functions, you can do it. Uh, serverless framework. Anyone have heard of serverless IO or serverless framework? Um, there basically is a, it's a methodology where they help you. It's a framework to package your actions and configure your actions. Um, and they're trying to be vendor agnostic. So you can do it for Lambda. You can do it for Google. You can do it for OpenWhisk. Um, I was going to say IBM, but it's, it's OpenWhisk. And I've been telling, telling them to remove IBM from the OpenWhisk term because um, this, is a, this is an open source project. Um, so you can use serverless framework to, to package your apps. And we also have a, now we'll be talking about WISC deploy. It's, it's, it's another way of you can deploy your apps uh, as functions. So we just one vendor choice, like we were saying. We're, we're looking for users. PubNub, if you have a, um, a chat application or uh, it's, it's a service of, it's a data, data stream service out there. They did integration. Again, using the REST APIs, open APIs, nothing specific about Bluemix being running in Bluemix or not. Uh, they're using the REST APIs to open with. So you want to connect PubNub to an instance of open with running on your VMs, you can just go ahead and do it. Um, in terms of community, developer tooling, that's acting the area that we need help for uh, to grow the user base of people trying it, giving feedback, and things get better. We have a, an IDE plugin for VS Code, so you can, instead of using the CLI, you can use the IDE to create the action, invoke it, and so far. Uh, we have no red. Um, if you're doing IoT, some people use no red to create uh, workflows. From those workflows, you can define uh, actions and evoke your actions at a, a certain points of, of no red uh, uh, points. Um, I think we have, we have time for, for a quick demo. Let me, I uh, was going to do it live, but I'm running out of time. So let me see if we can place a few videos I did a few minutes ago. So yeah, let's do this one. So I'll, I'll talk while I don't want, I was going to say I don't want to make typos while I code, but there's typos in this video, it's raw. <laughs> um, so I'll go over what is going on here. So basically just the, the rundown. You go to GitHub. Now we're in the, under the Apache organization. Uh, the, easy way, the easiest way is to get an Ubuntu system with Vagrant, where you do git clone CD to a folder with Vagrant, and then call this um, script that says hello. It will take a while to build all the containers. Uh, we're trying to optimize that to make it faster to get just a VM to give it a try. Um, once you do the, the hello command, you will have the CLI in your system. You have a, a Linux system running the Docker containers. And as you can see, uh, this is running locally in my laptop. It's 192.1.68. 1 
So you have the same environment that is on the cloud in your computer so you can develop and you can help in the community and be a contributor. Um, this is just a, a, one of the actions that come with the system. It's called Echo. You test it out. It works. Um, I'm going to try to create a, a function. Uh, so basically, this is Node.js. You create a function. See, those, those are typos in there. I, I know. Um, call it main. Uh, you can also export it um, with the package.json. Um, you need to return JSON, so I'll be returning a, an, an object. I can finish typing. Come on. I didn't want to cut anything, so. <laughs> um, so you, you create a payload of, of, of JSON, and that's what you return. Um, in this one, I think I'm just to say hello. Save it, and then how do, I, how do I send it to the system? So you run whisk action create, give it a name, hello, and then give it the, the source code. It could be a zip file, or it could be a, a JavaScript file. Um, I think I made a, another typo in there. Creation. It's what's already created, so it, it fell. So it update, usually can create it or update it. Uh, and updated it. If you want to invoke it, you do with action invoke. Um, type hello, and then that would run the the action and return it. Dash R says just return me the 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 result. If I run it with dash B, it says blocking, and they get all the metadata. So I'm going to show how many milliseconds it took. So this one took six milliseconds to run. So it went up. The the Docker container was running, and it ran. It was warm. Um, let me see. Logs. So people ask about logs. You do console.log, so standard error, standard output. That's captured by the system and then available later on that, on that metadata of activation ID. So I'm going to run it again. Update the code, so it's console.log. Uh, run the, uh, invoke the action again with dash B. Yeah. Or just the activation ID. So that's your like, ticket ID. If you want to go later and find all your activations, you basically you do with, with action and then pass it, pass it the activation ID, and then you get um, when did it start it, when did it run, how long it took, and then the logs. As you can see, there's a, an array of all the logs um, that you put in. So you have an error, right, or you have an exception. You will see that in the logs that you have undefined. It's not a function, right? <laughs> uh, the typical error. Uh, this one, see what I'm doing here. I did just run it multiple times, so you can see that the first, the first time you run it, it will take some latency because we do something with Docker. It's a cold start, and then the later functions that it run, it will run faster. Let me just, just play it again. Is it? Oh, uh, the last one is parameters. How do I pass parameters to my function? Uh, basically, they come in, in an object. So um, in here, I'm using ES6 uh, how to parse the parameters. Um, says Carlos, hello. Then I'll put uh, the parameter in there, and that will come in. So the way you run it with the REST, you pass the parameters with REST API is just a payload of, of the body of JSON. Uh, in this case, I'm using the CLI. Um, that's the infra guys uh, talking. Um, and uh, one, one tip is if you want to learn what is happening behind the scenes, uh, there's a dash V. I don't know if I have it here. Uh, there's a dash V flag that you can pass, and then you can see like, what is this HTTP client doing. It's just calling REST APIs uh, against the, the OpenWhisk uh, system. And if I do Jim, then it says, hello, Jim, hello, Carlos, or Rich. Uh, dash V. So if you do dash V, you will be able to see, like, how do I call this with curl, right? So you will see a, uh, the URL, your authentication token, uh, which is basic auth. And then how do I pass a parameter is the request body. So far, so good. So I think that's, that's good for the demo. Let me see if it's finished. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, let's go back to see like what did actually happened there. Let's see if I go over there. So, um, so what's happening behind the scenes is your actions are sandbox in a Docker container. So, uh, when you do with action invoke, 
that equals to a Docker run. We, the, the, the team did some optimizations and looking into performance, actually even looking more, uh, we found that, that using the Docker CLI command was too slow, it wasn't giving us that uh, lower level uh, performance. So we're now we're using run C, it's a, it's, it's a different level of managing, managing containers. And we're able to Docker pause or unpause a Docker container in single digit millisecond. So there's no overhead on that. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing that we do is when you do Docker run, you have the penalty of was saying getting uh, the image downloaded from Docker Hub, or even if it's cache, you know, creating creating that image for the first time and having it in memory. What we do for the language when we say we have languages that we support, we already have um, some images already pre-warm, ready to go, listening on a port. So it's a server running. So that's why people laugh when say serverless. There's a server listening in there. Uh, for example, for Node.js, there's a server in the Docker container ready for a function, but it's, it's functionless. It doesn't have your code. So the first thing that happens is it runs an init, and that gets the, the code initialized. And then that's why this, the, the next requests that come into the system as a burst or just, just REST APIs uh, will keep the, the, the container very warm or hot, it should say. And then every run, that's why you get single digit millisecond overhead. Um, so that's kind of the optimizations that are different for, for OpenWiz versus other systems, and also uh, looking with other orchestration uh, for, for containers like Kubernetes and Mesos, where it's not that trivial to get some workload or some action to run on any, any container anywhere. So we are doing some optimization to to do everything that we can, so the only thing missing is your, your code, but even when we have your code, it's already in memory, so we can just run it right away. So that's, that's why the, the serverless, we get it to the point that it's, it's a similar thing hitting a server than hitting a serverless API. Whoever is using it will not will be able to tell. Uh, that's, this is what I was saying before, is uh, we're working with uh, having a way to deploy the, the, the control plane. So this deploying open with the controller and the invokers, do it with Kubernetes, uh, do it with Docker Compose, and then see if, if it makes sense or how do we do it to make, uh, make invokers uh, be able to use the utilization of, of containers with Kubernetes or Docker Compose or Mesos. But, um, and, and, and that's another call. If you are an expert on these areas, we're looking for contributors on that area to either document it or looking at how to orchestrate it um, for, for the project. So uh, we're open to, to other deployment options. Uh, what is serverless good for? Let me see, I think that's uh, going to get into use cases. Um, people say anything, but uh, if, you have, if you have something that is, has to be up and running and it has a persistent connection, then no. If you have, uh, somebody was asking me if I have a server, one server is fully utilized, no, I only have one server, then, then this is not a choice, right? You're optimizing for something that you should not be optimizing. Other than that, um, if you have things that are uh, workloads that you can split into smaller, smaller problems, smaller functions, it's a good thing. If you have burstiness, right, you have a heavy load uh, in a certain period or heavy load, that you, don't, you cannot predict, this is something that can scale. Uh, some of the users and, and applications that are building out there and, uh, and integrators, um, I'm going to go over a few, but um, one that I'm excited that was helping is Weather, Weather Gods. They, it's a mobile app that is using the periodic um, alarm system. It's also using CloudAnt or CouchDB. We basically tell us, um, I think I have an example. It's, it sends push notifications uh, in the morning and in, during the night, and it gives you uh, data about the weather. So it needs to orchestrate those things, but it doesn't have to be running all the time. So it's a certain period that it needs to do that, that uh, uh, analysis on the data and also pushing the push notifications to the users. So data processing is one of the use cases. If you insert information to a, to a CouchDB, CouchDB has a notification API and also supports, we, uh, recently added support for filters, so if you want to listen to events coming from your database that says when a customer gets inserted into a database, run this function against that data or fetch that customer, and it could be like customer 
bought a car, but it bought a bicycle, and you want to only listen to customers that bought a car, you can do a filter and only listen to that, to that data coming in. Um, another, uh, one, one of the customers we work with is uh, uh, Scythe, Scythe Spirit or Meter Spirit, I think it's called Scythe Spirit. They reduce um, the, their cost by 90%, so they were paying a lot because they were using co constant service all running all the time, and also um, dealing with all that data and burst of, of, of submitting up, uh, images, um, they made the application faster, uh, 10 times faster. And these applications basically is uh, for travel business that they needed pictures, and those pictures, they wanted to crop them and resize them. Um, and then it's kind of cool because you can point in, a, in, in the picture an area that you want to focus, and it will crop the picture on that where you're clicking, not just the, the whole picture. Um, so he has a lot of customers that are sending him images that he needs to do that, that uh, image processing. Um, so he's doing it with open, open with, so he has some bursts uh, that just offloads to open with and just gets processed with his actions. And he's using Node.js to process that, that Im images. Uh, another example is uh, processing checks. Uh, Santander did a POC with uh, one of our uh, uh, Open with advocates where they were processing images, doing um, uh, OCR recognition on the checks. And it's something that it happens in a certain amount of time, right? So everybody gets paid maybe on the 15 or the 30, or some people just get on Fridays. So they were doing a lot of manual work to get that process those checks. So we're, now they're using uh, Open with in a serverless fashion that they can handle that burst. Um, so this week there was a lot of talk about IoT and data and message, message streams. Um, message Hub or Kafka is another way of getting data into the system and then be queued into, into a certain message broker, basically Kafka, and then you can um, create triggers that will run your functions and get against that data or whenever that data comes in. And the last one is what I was talking about, it was periodic, so if you want to do run a certain task a certain amount of time uh, or every other week or once a month, basically supporting a cron syntax, you can run your function to kick something out uh, with, a, with a periodic. And what is becoming very popular are chatbots. Um, with the API gateway, you'll be able to support the APIs uh, when you type things in your, in your, in your channel. Uh, Select has an API that can start sending those messages to to an API that you define where you can have uh, OpenWIS, and OpenWIS will process those messages and maybe come back uh, with analysis on, that, on those messages. Or uh, one thing that we were talking about, there's a lot of Apache projects using Slack, and there's a, there's a concern or just an idea of like, how do we get these messages into the dev list, right? How do we get, if it doesn't happen in dev list, how do we know how to archive? So, uh, we'll be talking about creating something generic that will work for every project that you can install in your open Slack and maybe do a, a daily digest or when a thread gets started, send, send an email to the dev list, right? Send, create a new dev, uh, dev list thread. Um, and that's basically a chatbot. Is, is your, you're communicating with it. Or just send any commands. In, in Slack, you can create a bot that says, run me this backup process or create me a Jira issue uh, if you're using Jira. Um, <coughs> And the chat but would do it, but you need some backend, so that's just a function running uh, in OpenWhisk. Um, I think we have QA, but if you want to know more information, uh, in terms of Bluemix, you get an account um, and you can use it. I can show, I can show a demo of, of, of message queue with, in, in Bluemix. Let me show that. Um, because I saw a lot of people interested. And the, pa the package, this service provider, this event driver trigger provider for Kafka is open source. It's one of the repos that Matt is going to point out. Uh, but I'm going to show it here with uh, Bluemix of how would you implement that. Let's see if we can get that, get that to full screen. Um, so in, in Bluemix, we give you, you can create a Kafka, a, a Kafka uh, service. And here I define, that's tiny, a, a topic called IoT. Uh, if I go to OpenWhisk and I go to the develop tab, this is kind of a nice, nice UI for, for people getting started. 
I have a, a function. I can create a function. Uh, I call it, um, what did I call it? Take data. Yeah, so I'm taking data from message queue, uh, from Kafka, message hub. I'm using Node.js, you can use any language, you can use Python. I create the action, and then um, I think I edit the action to get the messages that are coming from, from Message Hub uh, from Kafka and process them, right? Um, in this example, can I, I do 2x this thing? Yeah, that's better. Um, I take sensor data, so in this case, I'm just, uh, you have a sensor, you have a temperature, I get the sensor data, and I want to send a Slack notification. So it will take the data from Kafka, uh, take the piece that it wants, which is the temperature, create a text uh, for, for Slack, and then I will do a sequence where I can define this action, process the data, outputs a, a, another data, which is the text, to the Slack action, and the Slack action will send a message uh, to me to, to Slack about the temperature of the sensor. Um, it's going very, very slow. Let's see if I can do 8x. Yeah, so in here I'm creating a, um, a demo, take data, it runs Slack. I'm running Slack with my account. Um, my webhook from Slack. So I'm creating a sequence, and then I'm going to, um, after I save the action, I need, I need to name it something, so I think it says, uh, when data, Slack. Uh, again, we developers, that's our biggest problem, naming things, right? Um, so I think I call it when temperature, uh, data, Slack. Um, and I keep messing with the, with the name. I think we spend a lot of time naming methods, right, and variables. Um, so the sequence get created, close it. So that's kind of a visualization of the sequence. I have a sequence. Then, um, if I want to automate that sequence, I, how do I want to uh, how do I want to run that that sequence? I'm going to create a trigger. So if I click um, uh, run the run the the sequence, I can just run it from here and pass the temperature which is uh, 60, just testing it out, and let me see. I'll get the data, and here you can see all your activations of all your actions, and you can see the message that was sent to Slack um, through the sequence to the trigger of IoT. So I just put a message on IoT uh, Kafka, and that will send the, that will send the image. I think, I think that's it, at least um, that's Slack, and that's the message that the temperature is 60. So I think we have five minutes for, for questions, if there's any. Let me send this back. I don't want that. Let me see. Yeah, so we have, uh, if you want to join our Slack, if you have questions on getting started or creating your first Java function, you can go ahead and uh, have a few, a few questions. So how do you handle persistence? Would you pull out your database if you wanted to store states for these things? Or? Yeah, so persistent, uh, the question was, how do I handle persistent or, or state? So these functions have to run for a certain amount of time. You can configure them up to five minutes, um, and they're stateless. So you have to write your application in a stateless way. Uh, so using something like Redis, uh, using something like uh, CouchDB or Cloudant, or using uh, MySQL, right, connecting. So you need to have a connection somewhere where you persist that data. Um, for those that are, you know, serverless hackers, they cheat a little bit where they cache. So if there's a function running and you have to do some work or cache some data, you can check if the last function left something and just, and just use it. But don't assume that it's going to be there. 
uh, that's just one, one trick because your function may land on that same container, but it may land on another, another one. But it's a, if it's a step that you can save, I don't know, 20 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds for a, fu for a function that runs 500 milliseconds, um, you can do that trick. Um, but other than that, yeah, like you, you were saying, uh, connect out to persistent. Um, and another way is your, your whole app is, is the state, right? So you can create a function that process a record from one database, uh, analyze an image, or do IoT recognition, and, and then that action would put it into an, another database or the same database, and that would trigger another action to handle it. So you don't have to maintain the state to see if that thing was done, and this thing was done, and this thing, then I do this, just follow, follow the programming model using sequences and triggers. Any question? Deployment of your function? Yeah, like in the, in the real setting, where uh, you're not, well, I, I've never used a way to do stuff. Yeah, yeah, so this is um, marketing, I guess, what you said, or demo. Uh, in real production, you will just see ICD, right? Something like Jenkins and something like GitHub. Uh, Matt has a, a cool project he's showing, which is called Wiz Deploy. Um, Adobe has another GitHub repo, which is if you push something to, Git, uh, to your Git repository, then a webhook will call an open with action that will package your action and update your actions like meta, right? So it's just a rest, at the end of the day, you're just calling either the CLI or the REST API to submit your zip file for that action to update the code, uh, or jar file for Java or your Python zip file. So yeah, Jenkins, Bash, it's just a REST API, or Coral, uh, actually. Uh, but we, the way we do it, we do the CLI. I think the CLI is becoming kind of like the common denominator, so wrap the CLI with Gradle, wrap it with something else, and um, the CLI is just your interface to the REST API, so you, you abstract yourself a little bit. Does that answer your question? Cool. Has there been any discussion about adding a uh, event supplier for like an active MQ, for an MQTT server, like, like Apache Active MQ? Um, it's not there, but we're open to, to support it, um, and we can create a repo if somebody wants to invest time on, on doing that. Um, to, for, for, that type, and for those type of things, you can use the pattern of, of Kafka, which is basically, is there's two APIs. When you create a trigger, you're defining that I want this trigger for MQTT, and then you have to do a second call, REST API saying, hey, MQTT, start, listening or handling these messages and fire this trigger, which basically is just send an HTTP post request to it. Uh, but no, people have done MQTT through Bluemix um, that then they do a web, a web app and then it will trigger the, the trigger manually. But natively, it will be, be nice to have that. Uh, the same thing for MySQL. Uh, I, I did a little research and I, I think it's possible using the MySQL binary log so have a daemon that can listen to anything that happens in that SQL, and then firing triggers. Uh, also, I, I learned this week about Rocket, Rocket MQ, is it cool? It would be cool to have, to have uh, Rocket MQ firing actions on, on, data, on data streams. But uh, that, uh, as part of the open source project, nobody's working on it, so we're looking for, for contributors. What is the difference between open source, the open with open source versus the commercial in IBM? Yes, the open whisk. What open whisk? Yeah, open whisk. Uh, the difference are um, it's a multi-tenant. Uh, we 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 take the open source project and we deploy it in our cloud. So we're using the VMs. Um, what will be different? I think the authentication. What I showed was authentication. So if you're deploying open whisk in your company you will need to um, implement that piece of how do I authenticate a user in my company if you want to deploy OpenWiz also in, in your environment. And the other piece is uh, that is coming is Elasticsearch. So in, in the proprietary system, since we're maintaining all these users, we use using Elasticsearch to do the monitoring and the logs. So if you have to deploy OpenWiz, then you have to get the logs of, of the system somewhere with some, with some system, and that's not available in open source yet. And that's the part that we're working to, to have that. Um, 
Other than that, I think that I think that's it. I don't know. I might want to add. Oh yeah, the UI. So um, in in the commercial, you will see that that UI that I showed to create an action and link the things and the boxes and also the nice graphs about those those things. Those are available only in the commercial. Uh, in the open source, you basically what I show with the command line interface, you get the REST API raw. Sorry? So if I specify function taking too much of memory, right? How can I specify the memory setting too much? Yeah, so when you create the the, the function, you pass a flag called limit. So you can set the limit of of memory. Basically it's a it's a cap. Um, and then that's what you pay for. So I think the max is five twelve and we're we're talking about increasing that to one gig. So you can have up to one gig. But today it's five twelve. If you use the open source version, just go to the Ansible script and they'll change that to whatever uh, amount you have. But as a user, when you create the function, you will create a function with 256, another function with 128, another function with 512, depending what the function is going to do, if it's going to handle a large buffer of data or not. Um, for IoT, like for IoT or, or Kafka, you don't know how many messages you're going to get on how big is each me message. So you may give it a 512 megs. And also the time limit. If you want, you want functions to run for for more than x amount of minutes. Yeah, time out. Time, time out. Yeah, that's the. Yeah. Yeah. Any any questions or comments or? So if I have a whizbang function that exists in Java or Java. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, for for Java, uh, it is it has GIJSON, Google JSON is the API. So you create a jar file. Uh, it has to have your your Java code inside, and then the, you specify what is the class that implements that function, um, and then it, it, it will run. But uh, any any dependencies you have to build in this in this one single jar. So you have to compile everything, and we have examples that show you how to do it with Gradle. But you will need to adapt it because maybe your your function doesn't take GIJSON, so you have to adapt it to to that to that API. But again, it's it's open source. So if you're all using the open source version, you can change that piece or adapt it uh, mm -hmm. for that. I was going to go for uh, for the docs. Let me see if I have the docs somewhere here. Yeah, when you when you create your function whisk action create dash dash Java, here's the jar file. You can pass another parameter saying uh, memory. How much memory do you want to allocate to that to that function? Yeah, and that basically that memory you're controlling the memory uh, through the container. Yeah. So that that field of, of memory it will be similar of doing a Docker run and passing. Hey, this container should not have more memory than X, and then uh, the JVM inside. And for Java, it's very interesting. It's um, it's a it's a J, it's a Java proxy with text your request and then runs your function. So for Node.js, it's Node.js. So we try to optimize for the language so the performance is is better. So we have different proxies uh, for the Docker containers. Is there a concept of multi-tenancy in, in this separating users from? Uh, the, the isolation is through Docker. So um, the Docker is, uh, is locked down with IP tables and security. So you should not be able to break out from your container and access another container that is running another function. So that's the level of isolation that we have. Uh, but we have a bunch of VMs running the functions. But the isolation is done at the level of the container. I think we ran out that, OK. So I think that that's that's it. If you want to, this this the same room, right, Matt? If you want to stick around and learn more about the other tools, the other repos, um, you can stick around for the next talk. So, but so far, thank you for coming. Yeah.